Morning, everyone. Morning. Glad to see you here this morning. Springtime is great, isn't it? I saw Robin the other day. Did my heart good. Yeah. <laughs> Today is daylight savings time day. Any of you have trouble have trouble springing ahead this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we gain an hour of daylight in the morning and lose an hour of daylight in the evening. When you think about it, only the government would think that you could take a blanket, cut a foot off the top, sew it to the bottom, and think you have a longer blanket. You know? I've got some trivia for you. Did you know that the first daylight savings time policy began in Germany? On May 1st of 1916... Of all time. They thought it would uh, save energy during World War I. They, they lost, so I don't know if it did them any good. Well, I wanted to make this talk topical. And since it's daylight savings time day, I decided I'd try to figure out how to make this uh, you know, work together as a, from a biblical perspective. And I thought, daylight savings time. Daylight. Daylight is from the sun. Jesus is the Son, with an O. You have savings, Jesus saves. And time, now is the time of our salvation. Pretty clever, huh? And then I thought, you know what, that's, that's cheesy even for me. So, <laughs> so I decided to talk about baseball instead. Spring training is just around the corner. How many of you played some kind of sports in your lifetime? You know, I think most of us have played something or other. Uh, baseball was my game. I was a pretty good shortstop in Little League. I didn't get to play in high school because I had to work in the spring, but I loved the game of baseball. A few years ago, I went to a t-ball game. Are you familiar with t-ball? It's for four- and five-year-olds. They have a tee about the eight ball, and they set the ball there so the kids, you don't have to pitch it to the kids. Well, these four- and five-year-olds are out there on the field, and they don't have a clue of what they're supposed to do. They can't run. They can't hit. They can't catch. Uh, they don't know where to run to. You see them out in the field. You know, they're picking at the dirt or daydream or chasing butterflies and stuff. And by the fourth or fifth game, they begin to get a, a sense of where they're supposed to run to and uh, a general idea of where they're supposed to stand. Uh, they begin to get some inkling of the fundamentals of the game. Well, you don't need, you, you don't expect t-ballers to be hitting home runs or to make a shoestring catches and that sort of thing. You, you consider yourself lucky if they go the whole game without wetting their pants. <laughs> but uh, as they get older, as they learn more and more of the fundamentals, and as they practice, their play starts to get better. Well, in the Christian life, some of us are t-ballers. Some of us are little leaguers or pony leaguers, and we may even have some triple A'ers or professional quality Christians here. But uh, no matter where we are in our walk, we need to have a good understanding of the fundamentals. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Uh, what's the very first thing that a baseball coach teaches the kids, you know, whether it be fielding, throwing, or hitting. Keep your eye on the ball. That's the most important thing. They tell you that on everything. If you're doing, the, if you're fielding, they tell you get in front of the ball, get your glove down low, keep your head up, and keep your eye on the ball. Then when you're hitting, you know, keep your swing level. Don't try to kill it. Just meet the ball and keep your eye on the ball. Very important. The very first thing you learn to play in playing baseball is the fundamentals. Of course, as the, as the kids get older, the coach doesn't have to remind them about each little detail. You're keeping your glove down and stuff. He can just stand in the dugout and shout, you know, keep your eye on the ball, and they'll figure out what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, that's kind of what I want to do today. I want to stand in the dugout and holler at you. 
give you some of the fundamentals. Uh, some of the, I want to give you some things that will help you to keep your eye on the ball and ultimately keep your eye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for you little leaguers and pony leaguers, this will be some pretty basic stuff, but for you T-ballers, you know, and the rest of us, we need reminding once in a while of just what the fundamentals are. So I'm going to give you some things that occurred to me that are fundamentals. Tip number one is grow your relationship with God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the most fundamental thing in the Christian walk. I believe that our personal happiness comes from our relationship with God. John 10, 10, uh, Jesus said, uh, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The King James Version uh, uses the word abundantly. You may have life abundantly. Not just plentiful, but overflowing. And abundant. As believers, we all have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did for us. We're the children of God, and we're heirs with Jesus. But what kind of shape is your relationship in? I think about a family on a walk. You have the parents, they're walking hand in hand, strolling along together, talking quietly. The kids are off exploring. They don't know what the parents are talking about. They can't hear the conversation. They're just off doing their own thing. Well, which one are, are you in your relationship with, with Jesus? Are you the parents or the kids? Well, of course, we need to be the parents. Um, well, several years ago, I, uh, I had this strong desire to be led by God. I, when I'd have an, an important decision to make, I'd want to make sure that it was in God's will. And so I would pray about it and I'd say, God, speak to me in a loud voice so that I can hear you. You know, speak loud enough so that I can't miss what you're saying because I want to do your will. In retrospect, I guess I was asking God to yell at me the way I used to yell at my kids when they wandered too far away. And then I read 1 Kings chapter 19. It made a, made a lot of difference in my life. To give you some background, uh, the prophet Elijah had just had a great victory over the priest of Baal. And uh, he was afraid that uh, King Ahab and Jezebel were going uh, to kill him. And they, in fact, did, wanted to kill him. So he ran away out into the desert. And he's tired, he's hungry, he's depressed, discouraged, and he needs to hear from the Lord. And this is what uh, 1 Kings 19 says, starting in verse 11. The Lord said, Go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Now a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The King James Version says, there came a still, small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled back his, put his, pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Well, after reading those verses, it, it just really hit me. I was praying the wrong prayer. I was asking for the wrong thing. I finally understood that God does not shout. God's never in a hurry. So I changed my prayer, and I began asking God to draw me closer to himself so that I could hear him when he whispers. And it changed everything. We need to have a close relationship with the Lord. It's fundamental. We need to be close enough to him so that we can hear him when he whispers but not only that, we need to be listening so that his voice isn't drowned out by the cares of this world. 
And, you know, it's our responsibility to work on that relationship. The most fundamental thing in playing baseball is to keep your eye on the ball. The most fundamental thing in growing our relationship with God is keeping our eyes on Jesus. And we keep our eyes on Jesus through prayer and through the reading of God's Word. Again, I, I believe that our personal happiness depends on our relationship with God. And our relationship with God depends on prayer and Bible study. Well, if you're not praying and reading the Word of God on a regular basis, shame on you. If you're not praying and reading the Word of God on a regular basis, I'd bet dollars to donuts that your, your relationship with God is distant. There's nothing more important to a believer than regular prayer and Bible study, period. It, it feeds us, it nourishes us, it builds our faith and it makes us stronger Christians. And it draws us closer to God. When you're distant from God, you're not going to hear Him when He whispers. And when you don't hear Him when He whispers, you're going to miss out on blessing after blessing. You'll miss out on His wisdom when you want to make a decision. You'll miss out on that peace that passes understanding. So, oh, I guess like the T-baller that has to learn to keep his eye on the ball, we Christians have to learn to keep our eye on Jesus through prayer and Bible study. It's, it's fundamental. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. And that's why elsewhere in the Bible it tells us to pray continually. Pray throughout the day. A running conversation throughout the day with God. That will help you draw closer to him. You need to set aside some time to be alone with God, to pray and study His Word. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be a, even a half hour. It's just a, a few minutes to read a chapter or uh, just a few verses. And to some take time to, to pray and to listen for that still, small voice. Well, tip number one is work on growing your relationship with God. Keep your eye on Jesus it's fundamental. I've been thinking about tip number two quite a lot lately. We've talked about it in my Sunday school, uh, school class a few times recently. Tip number two is, remember, this world is not your home. There's that old country and western uh, hymn. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckoned me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Romans 8.16 The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And Philippians 3.20 just flat out tells us our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. We can't look to anything in this world to bring lasting satisfaction. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. I've told a story many times about uh, I wanted to buy a pickup truck. And I, I saved for literally years to have enough money to buy a pickup truck that I wanted. I did my research. I knew exactly what it was. I knew where to get it. I went to the dealership. I said, that's the one I want. It's just what I've been looking for. So I bought it, and on the way home, I was finding stuff I didn't like about it. There's nothing in this world that's going to give you lasting satisfaction. Not even pickup trucks. You know, in a couple months, we're going to be celebrating Memorial Day. Uh, you know, we set aside that time to, uh, as a nation, remember the people that have given their lives in the service of the country. We have to remember that here, in the freest country in the world, 
we have to take time to remember that freedom is not free. But as Christians, we need to remember that our salvation also is not free. Jesus took our sins upon himself and he died a horrible death on the cross so that you and I can claim heaven as our true home. Jesus paid the cost for our sin. I've always been a patriotic guy, even as a little kid. I've studied our country's history. Uh, I'm grateful and for all the people that have given their lives in service of their country. I'm proud that I served in the army. But lately, when it seems so apparent that our country is headed down a path of disaster, when it seems like we're losing some of our freedoms, when the killing of unborn babies becomes the law of the land, when government edicts contradict God's design for men and women, I remember that ultimately this world is not my home. I do have certain loyalties, you know, to the, the world here. I, I'm proud to be an American. I just, I thank God that I was born in America. I'm proud to be a Michigander. I've been all over the world, but I always want to come back to Michigan. And I'm proud that I'm, I'm a member of Calvary Church of Weberville. But you know, uh, none of those things really mean much without first being a citizen of heaven. When I was in the Army, uh, I lived in Homestead, Florida for two and a half years. I was in the Army, attached to the Navy on an Air Force base, and I worked in a top secret facility. Nobody knew what I was doing. Not even me. I was comfortable in Florida. I lived off base, had a decent house, had a, had a car. I knew my way around. I'd made a few acquaintances. Uh, but Homestead, Florida was never my home. Uh, I was never really accepted by the locals. I was, uh, in, I was in the military. They knew I was only going to be there for a little while. Then I would leave. And as nice as it was in southern Florida, I longed to be back home in Michigan. And that's kind of how I feel about this world. You know, it's really wonderful here. You know, that God is so good to us. Um, his creation is just magnificent. It's so beautiful. It brings tears to your eyes sometimes. He provides for us and he cares for us. And we can enjoy that peace that passes understanding. And yes, sometimes the locals don't always accept us as Christians. But you know, sometimes I get awfully homesick for heaven. You ever feel that way? When... Uh, Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992. Everything that I knew about Homestead, Florida, was destroyed. And I mean flattened. Uh, these were cement block homes. The whole neighborhood was just flat. The place I'd lived in for two years was gone. But you know what? I don't miss it, not one little bit. Uh, and someday, this world is going to be completely gone. And I won't even think about it ever again because I'll finally be home where I belong. This world is not your home. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You need to live like representatives of our true home so that other people will see us and they'll, they'll want what we have. Yeah, about the only thing that's going to help you keep your eyes on Jesus in this dark and sinful world is regular prayer and Bible study. It's fundamental. Well, lastly, tip number three, we need to hang in there. Look what the Bible tells us. This is from Jude, uh, beginning in verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, 
In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. And we go to, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Therefore, since we, have, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Run with perseverance. Keep your eyes on Jesus so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. Fellow believers, don't, don't give up. Hang in there. Keep your eyes on Jesus. God will not forsake his own. He's gracious, he's compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and who relents from sending calamity. Hebrews 13.5 says, Keep our, our lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's a wonderful, powerful promise. God will never leave us. He will not forsake his own. So when it seems like the world is falling apart around you, when it looks like our legislatures can't get any dumber, when it looks like our government is corrupt beyond words, when it, it looks like greed and self-centeredness are winning the day, when our culture begins calling good things evil and calling evil things good, when all manner of perversion and licentiousness become commonplace, we still have to hang in there. God knows what he's doing. He has a plan. He's with us, and he will not forsake us. Here in America, it seems like Christians are becoming more and more of a target. Both the only thing that you can openly criticize these days are Christians. That's what it seems like. But American Christians really have it pretty good compared to believers in other parts of the world. Um, I follow some uh, websites online. Uh, the Christian Post is one of them. Faithwire, you may be familiar with. And I also look at uh, Christian headlines. Here's some articles from those recent articles. Uh, in Canada, Canada of all places, at least two pastors have been jailed for conducting church services. And this one's very important. Last year, the Chinese communist said that Christianity has no place in China. And they have implemented what they call educational measures encouraging children to hate God. That's true. They're doing that. I find it somewhat suspect to hate something that you say doesn't exist. But... Falani herdsmen, uh, who are Muslim, uh, killed a church elder and abducted three other Christians and killed 11 others in northwest Nigeria on February 16th, just a month ago. Venezuelan Christians were attacked and branded with crosses by a group of hooded men. Turns out that this group of hooded men were uh, drug dealers who don't like the idea that Jesus can transform lives. Police in India allowed some Hindu extremists to attack churches, and then they arrested the Christians. And lastly, two Christians studying the Bible in a park were arrested and charged with blasphemy in Pakistan. The list goes on and on and on about how uh, Christians are persecuted. Maybe we should have a memorial day for those who have given their lives for their heavenly home. 
James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love him. Galatians 6.9. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. Romans 5, 3. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We have to persevere. We need to hang in there. And the only way that we can successfully hang in there is if we keep our eyes on Jesus. And the only way we can keep our eyes on Jesus if we ha- is if we have that close relationship that we get through prayer and Bible study. I'm going to ask the uh, worship team to come back up. So I've given you some fundamentals today. But we before we go any farther, I, I have to confess to feeling a, a little more than, uh, more than a little hypocritical about all this. Uh, I'm up here reminding all of you to remember the fundamentals of Christian living. You know, keep your eyes on Jesus. And when I have a hard time doing it myself, and if I am having a hard time, I'm sure that there are others that have a, a difficult time doing it. I don't always take time to read my Bible the way I, that I should. I don't always remember to pray, especially when things are going good. You know? Sometimes, especially when I read the news, I get so discouraged I just want to throw in the towel and, you know, Lord Jesus, take me now, kind of a thing. I take my eyes off Jesus and I put them on me and I grow distant from God. And then I have trouble hearing that still small voice. But you know what? God is so good. He loves us so much. He understands our human frailties and he he knows that we are sinful creatures. Even when we fail to do the things that we should, when, when we fail to keep our eyes on Jesus, he never stops loving us. He's always waiting with arms wide open for us to return to him. And when we wander off, he reminds us to come back and to keep our eyes on Jesus. He'll convict us of our sin He'll lead us to confession and repentance. I know from personal experience how how sweet and wonderful it is to get back into the Bible and to start praying again. God's always there, always waiting for us. Well, we need to grow our relationship with God. Don't forget to pray and read your Bible. This world is not your home. You're a citizen of heaven, and we need to act like it. We need to hang in there. God's in control. He has a plan. God will not forsake his own. We need to develop the habit of prayer and Bible study. But above all, above all, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Just stand and sing with us one more time.